The Volvo C30 might be the best looking Volvo ever, even better looking than a brick. But it was designed at a time when Volvo wasn't really known for its aerodynamics. In fact, it was known for the exact opposite reason. So how aerodynamic was the C30 then? As we'll see, the results are surprising. Also, the stock C30 version is cool and all, but there was also another version, the R design version. It was a souped up version with a much larger rear spoiler, which might even intimidate the stock version. How did this design affect the car's aerodynamics though? Was it all show? Well, we simulated both the stock version and the more racy version at 100 miles per hour, pretty quick. And this was commissioned by one of your amigos, Sora. If you'd like us to simulate your very own car, let us know here. Now we have a few different types of plots. This one shows the velocity around the car in meters per second, and the lines show the general flow path in this plane. We also have this type of plot, which shows the pressure in pascals. Let's first look at the stock version because it is more common, but also has quite different aerodynamics to the R design, as we'll see later. In the center plane, the stock version is really a mix. For example, the front face is okay, not great, not bad. The reason I say that is because we definitely do get flow deceleration on the face, and that comes with our old Nemesis high pressure. That pushes the car back and increases the drag. But one major benefit in the C30's favor is that the face is quite small. That's in part because it has a fairly small engine. So the front in general didn't need to be that big to house it. So we get this major benefit which helps minimize the drag you produce at the front. So the front face is good. But if we look underneath, the bottom is horrendous. Well, I don't think we've seen a front lip quite this bad. There is just so much flow separation underneath. And before we even look at the drag orbit, we could bet all our magic beans that there is a lot of drag in this region. And yep, in the drag orbit, there is a lot of drag underneath. Now, this lip isn't usually used to reduce the drag, but it would be nice if, at the very least, we didn't get all this drag here. What the front lip is often used for is to produce downforce. Looking at the pressure plot, we definitely do get low pressure under here. So the air underneath here is sucking the car down to the road. That's all good downforce. But even though you do get good downforce here, I wouldn't say that it's a way of producing it in a desirable way. That's because you can see how unsteady it is. You get these periodic bubbles of low pressure. So the downforce produced will change with time. And even if the conditions around the car are the same still. The reason why it is so unsteady is because of the separation underneath. So this lip is just bad. It creates unnecessary drag and the downforce it does create is poor quality anyway. One simple way to fix this would be just to round the bottom of the lip a little. It would be almost unnoticeable, but provide the air flowing over it a smoother transition to the underbody. As it stands, the flow has to make a right angle turn, and flows don't like doing that. In a way, I'm actually impressed at how large the wake is underneath. You don't see that every day. So this is one of the bad parts of this car. But if we look over the hood, we now see a good part. In fact, the hood is one of the better ones we've seen. I should say that it's one of the better ones we've seen if you exclude the front edge, but because we want to be inclusive, we should look at that too. So this little edge where the grill meets the bodywork, there's a bit of drag here. That is to be expected because some flow won't go through the grill and it will be redirected over the top. So that edge trips the flow up and causes a little bit of drag. It's not much though. Once we clear that bit, the rest of the hood is very nice. We definitely do get flow acceleration. We can see how the flow becomes quite red. So it's now around 50 meters per second or so. That makes the pressure drop too. And that low pressure over the hood is bad for downforce because it's sucking the car up and cancelling out some of the downforce we're getting underneath. But pretty much every car has that problem. The great thing about the C30 is that the pressure doesn't drop that much here. I mean, the flow speed is about 45 meters per second already, and the flow speed over the hood is only like 10 or 20% higher than that. We've seen with other cars, like the M3 for example, where the flow accelerates way more than that. 
So why doesn't the flow accelerate that much then here? Well, it has a lot to do with the hood angle. Because it's so sloped up, the flow isn't forced to turn that much. That means it doesn't have to accelerate as much either. In turn, the pressure doesn't drop as much. And this angle doesn't just benefit the car in this hood region, oh no. It also benefits the windshield too. That's because the hood is blended more into the windshield. And I know the hood and windshield are still very distinct from each other, but the angle here is a lot better. The major benefit of that is the flow over the hood doesn't crash right into the windshield that much. We can see here that there is definitely some deceleration of the flow. It goes green and even blue, but this region is quite small. From that alone, we can conclude that less of the flow's energy is wasted, which means less drag. And if you look at the pressure plot, I think things are still pretty good. There is high pressure here, but it's not that bad, and actually, this region shows something very interesting. So you can see how the highest pressure region doesn't really occur where the hood meets the windshield. It actually occurs a little higher up from that. To understand why, let's look at the velocity plot again. Here, we see that where the windshield meets the hood, the flow is really just awake. There's no clean flow from the hood coming in. Instead, the flow over the hood really shoots more into the windshield and right about here. That's where we get the highest pressure too. And this alone shows how blending the hood into the windshield can reduce this high pressure zone. If you blend the two more, the flow over the hood won't shoot into the windshield as much, so the pressure will drop and hence the drag will drop too. Overall, I think the hood is really good. Moving to the roof, from a drag point of view, it's fine. The flow does accelerate, which means you're messing with the flow, but there's no wake, so the pressure drag will be low. Because the flow is faster though, the skin friction drag will be a little bit higher, but that's relatively small. So drag-wise, the roof is decent. Downforce wise, I think we all know that I'm not that thrilled with it. With the flow acceleration comes very low pressure. That means lift. And if you look at how much lift is produced at 100 miles per hour, it's almost 44 kilos. So about as much as a small cigar. We'll see later if and how the R Design version tackled this problem. Moving to the back, the wake is okay. This region is designed quite well. The flow over the roof gets guided well by the rear spoiler, and it's important to note its angle. So the rear spoiler could have been attached at any angle really, really up, really down, whatever. Volvo put it pretty horizontal. What that tells us is that they wanted a compromise between reducing the drag and reducing the lift. I say that because if Volvo wanted to reduce the lift, they would have flared it up. That would have kicked the flow up more and increased the downforce. If Volvo wanted to reduce the drag, they would have angled it down. That would have shot the flow down more and reduced the wake size and the drag. So here, I think we can be quite confident in saying that Volvo wanted a middle ground between the two. And if we were to just look at the lift produced, 43.8 kilos, that's a little hard to understand. I mean, that's quite a lot. But if we scale it according to the same speed as the standard 72 kph, it will produce more around 9 kilos. So it is still pretty bad, but not as bad as we might have first thought. And if we look at the drag coefficient, it came in at 0.32, which is good for hatchback and from the mid 2000s. So it was a pretty decent compromise in my opinion. They could have angled it up a touch, but it's still good here. Now, one thing we haven't covered is why there's a rear spoiler here to begin with. We've talked about its effects, but what would happen if you just remove it? Well, if the spoiler were removed, there'd just be the rear window. The flow would come to the rear of the roof, and it would maybe flow down a little bit before separating, but maybe not. In fact, it would probably change with time. One second it would flow down a little, then the next second it would separate at the roof line and then repeat that cycle. That makes both the lift and drag on the car unsteady. And it might even increase the drag coefficient. So adding this spoiler, which is pretty much mandatory these days, 
help stabilize the forces on the car, as well as potentially reduce the drag coefficient. But the wake isn't just helped by the rear spoiler. I'm really impressed with the diffuser as well. It does a great job kicking the flow up. It does that by keeping the flow mostly attached underneath and being angled up a little. That helps reduce the wake size and hence the drag coefficient too. And because it gets kicked up a little, more downforce is created too. This is an early example of a hatchback with a good diffuser. Even today, some hatchbacks don't have good diffusers, so this was well done. And if we move over a half a meter to the left, many of the aerodynamics of the car's features are the same. But there are a few key differences. One thing that is different in a good way is underneath the front lip. In the center plane, we saw a terrible wake, the stuff of nightmares. But here, the terribleness has been downgraded. There is still definitely some separation, but not nearly as much as in the center plane. This is something we can live with. And the reason why there is less wake here is not because the lip is any more rounded, but because less flow is being pushed underneath the lip. If we look closely, the flow kind of bends around the edge instead of having to do a sharp right turn, which is what we saw earlier in the center plane. So this region is definitely improved. One region that hasn't is the roof. Around halfway down, the flow is separated now. This is pretty uncommon and it's bad. The wake around the edges then become larger and more drag is formed from the rear. And while we're in this plane, we can see another familiar nemesis, the rear wheel wakes. They're bum rushing into the diffuser and making it really struggle to get good flow happening. Like we've seen in several recent videos, many diffusers suffer this problem and something like Streg's would help a lot with controlling this bad flow. If we look at this plane, which is 20 centimeters off the ground, we can see the front wheels have pretty big wakes. The drag orbit shows how much drag is coming off of them. This is very expected because the flow hitting them is quite fast and it separates around the tire's edge. Now, this is an important point because in a recent podcast episode, we went through some research that showed that this separation region is very much determined by the tread on the tires. It showed that with tread, in particular lateral grooves, so the grooves that go sideways, the flow will separate around the edge. This is an important point because the shoulder's sharpness and whether you have rim protectors or not become more or less non-issues. We know that the flow will separate over the edge now. That has major consequences downstream. We get these large wakes and more drag from them. Going a little further, down to 40 centimeters off the ground, the front wheel wakes are awesome. They're really housed well here and that means we get fairly small wakes now and less drag. But while the front wheels are good, the rear wheels leave a little to be desired. You can see how behind them, the flow just separates and we get a larger wake and more drag now. I think here, this separation happens because the rear of this particular wheel isn't housed by the rear bumper enough. So the flow behind it is really just a wake and trying to get a weight to attach to a surface again is very difficult. It's very unsteady, so it might attach momentarily, but then it'll pop off again. One way of fixing this is to bring the rear bumper out a little more. So we've seen some good regions and some bad regions for this stock car, and the drag coefficient is pretty good. The lift numbers are pretty bad though. So how did the R design styling affect these quantities? Let's see here. This is now the R design version. We see something very important. The front face's flow is more or less the same. We get some flow deceleration, but now the front lip is performing much better. The weight from it is way smaller. We do still get some drag from it, but overall I think it's better. It occupies a smaller region, and this lip achieves that by having this chamfered edge. For the stock version, the front lip is sharp. Here it's kind of blunt and that helps the flow go around it. You can see how the first flow angle is about 45 degrees, then it goes to about 45 degrees again. So breaking it up like that is much easier for the flow to stay attached around this edge. It still doesn't do that completely, but at least we don't get a huge wake blowing out. Now something a little surprising is that even though this lip is definitely better here for the R design, the diffuser doesn't seem to be working too differently because of it. Maybe there's a little more flow kicking up, but it's mostly the same it seems. So what that tells us here is that 
the bad flow the lip creates settles down by the time it reaches the diffuser. So the flow is good enough for the diffuser to not really care too much now. That's even more surprising when we think about the rear spoiler. So compared to the stock version, the rear spoiler is much larger for this R design version. It's in this plane, we can see that the flow gets kicked up quite a bit more by it. We'll get to that effect shortly, but I wanted to look at how this flow kicking up affects the flow underneath the diffuser. So it might seem a little weird that the kicking up of the flow here, or really doing anything to the flow here, this high up, would affect the diffuser's performance. So what can happen is that the flow kicking up here shifts the wake up more. That then makes more room for the flow underneath the diffuser to flow out from, and then that makes the diffuser perform better. Here though, the diffuser seems to kick the flow up a little more, but honestly, it's not that much, especially considering that this additional kick is because of the front lip too. So I really think that this diffuser is already doing very well, as well as it can really, and then all these other things don't really matter too much for its performance. If you wanted to improve its performance, it itself really needs to be modified. Anyway, let's now look at the direct effects of this larger rear spoiler. It really kicks the flow up a lot more. That's great for downforce production. In fact, if we look at the lift produced and compare it to the stock car, this R design erased all of the 44 kilos of lift produced and even produced a little bit of downforce about as much as a stick of chewing gum. That's really impressive. A lot of this is because of the large rear spoiler. In this plane, the upper surface isn't affected too much, the banjo is a little thicker, but it's pretty much not affected by the rear spoiler. Now, these simulations were done with open foam. If you want to learn open foam, then check out our courses here. Let's now move to this plane, half a meter over to the left. I'm kind of impressed that the flow over the roof isn't affected too much by the rear spoiler. It flicks up a little more, but its general pattern is pretty much the same. And actually, because it shoots up higher, there is faster flow that gets underneath it and goes down the rear window a little. That helps reduce the wake size here. And that then reduces the drag in this very small region here too. The wake from the front lip is also much better here. There doesn't seem to be any separation at all anymore. And in the drag orbit, there's also no drag in this region. This is all while still producing good low pressure underneath, which helps increase the downforce too. Now moving to this horizontal plane, which is 20 centimeters off the ground, the flow is a little tricky. So around the front and even the sides of the front wheels, the wake seems to be a little smaller for the R design car, but then at the rear, the wake seems much larger and definitely stronger. You can see how blue it is. For the stock car, there is definitely a wake behind the front wheels, but it doesn't seem to be as large or as strong. And in the drag orbit, the R design package then reduces the drag around the front and sides of the rear wheels. But behind it, it seems like it makes it much more like the regular stock version and even more. So while the R design helps the drag production around the front part of the wheel, it seems to make it a lot worse around the rear. For the R design, the rear wheel gets to see slower flow, which helps reduce the drag boost from it, that's because there's less kinetic energy that can be wasted on it. So even if it wastes all of the kinetic energy, there's still not that much. At 40 centimeters of the ground, there's really not anything better about the R design, and in fact, a few regions are worse. So for example, behind the front wheels, we get slightly larger wakes, and we saw in the drag orbit how that comes with much more drag, then the rear wake is larger too. So it seems very much like the R-Design package was more for downforce than for drag reduction. And in fact, moving up to 0.6 and 0.8 meters off the ground, the same can be said. The front wheel wakes are large, and that then feeds back to the rear wake and makes that a little larger too. That's because the flow on the rear edge doesn't stay attached anymore. So I think the R-Design package made the front wheel wakes worse. That then affects a lot of the flow. In fact, looking at the drag coefficient, with this R design, it jumps up from 0.32 to 0.36. So this package is really bad for drag production. But when you think about how good it was at eradicating the lift produced, maybe this drag penalty was worth it. If you're staying on YouTube, YouTube thinks you like this video, so check it out. Peace out, amigos.